Well, friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that you have brought us here together this day. We thank you for the gift of fathers among us. We thank you uh, that uh, you give uh, each of us a father, and, and whether our relationship with our fathers are uh, what they should be and what you've designed them to be or whether they are not. Lord, we thank you that uh, we can call you our father, our heavenly father, uh, who gives us all good things, who takes care of us in the ways that we need and who takes care of us in the ultimate way by sending Jesus who overcomes all of our fears of sin and death uh, and even the power of hell to to give us a wonderful life with you, an eternal life with you where all things are made right. Lord, as we hear these words today, bring them to our hearts that we might know you as our Father and our Lord, the Lord of mercy and love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are one of the disciples on the boat with Jesus. And you are fearing for your life. It's the dead of night on a pitch black lake in a raging storm. You can't see a thing, but you can feel the water filling the boats past your ankles. You've quit bailing because now you are hanging on for dear life. And the screams of the grown men in the boat with you are drowned out by the wind that sounds like a freight train. Lightning flashes. And in the couple seconds of daylight that the lightning provides, you see two contradictory things. You see a hellish nightmare of a raging sea with waves like skyscrapers collapsing all around you. And then you also see Jesus asleep a few feet away from you as if he just bought a new sleep number mattress. I don't get any commission, by the way. And so you yell as loud as you can, teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus slowly sits up as if you had gotten him up before his alarm was supposed to go off. Happy Father's Day, dads. And he calmly says in a still slightly scratchy morning voice, Peace, be still. And the sea reacts like it was sucker punched by God. Clouds flicker out as if they were a mirage, and the wind gasps as it's choked of air. And in the blink of an eye, the lake is like moonlit glass, and the boat slowly stops rocking. And cool, fresh air fills your lungs like a day up at the lake in Wisconsin. But you are not at peace. In fact, you are more terrified than you ever have been in your life. You are more scared of who is in the boat than what was going on outside of the boat. Because a storm that was about to kill you with such power that you couldn't do anything about it except wet your pants, you think, it's pretty wet out there, was instantly snuffed out at the groggy afterthought of Jesus. Who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Fear has a way of putting us in our place. When you fear the right things, you find freedom. When you fear the wrong things, you find slavery. You know, I I instill in my children a healthy fear of busy streets because that gives them freedom to play outside without the slavery of getting too intimate with traffic, right? Or another example is that uh, when I was young, I saw the movie Jurassic Park, all right, And I probably saw it a little too young because what that movie did for me is it instilled a healthy fear of T-Rexes in my life, 
which means that I avoid them at all costs. And I find my life to be a lot more freeing when I'm not being eaten. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? And if you know it by heart, go and say it with me. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What was that first weird? We should, or what was that first word? We should fear. Now, it might be fair to ask the question, wait, 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 wait. God wants us to fear him? Why would God want us to fear him? What, what, what is God trying to get at there? You know, the thing about fear is that fear reminds us that we are not all-powerful. We are not in control. We don't get to do whatever we want, which frankly is a hard pill for us to swallow as sinners. It puts us in our place, and we don't like being put in our place. We like being in charge. We like defying the rules. We like defying the limits. We like defying reality. We like the idea of being whoever we want. We like the idea of being entitled to whatever we want, doing whatever we want, and fearing no one. But as much as we wish that we could live that way, fear has a way of clarifying how things really are. Fear put the disciples in their place as slaves to their own mortality. And with three simple words, peace, be still. Jesus uses his fearsome authority and power as God to accomplish liberating salvation. See, the only thing more terrifying than the storm was Jesus. Jesus put the disciples in their place as his own. And in that boat, the disciples learned the horrifyingly good news of fearing Jesus above all things. What they learn is that there is freedom in having a limit, in not being in control, in letting someone like Jesus be your Lord, which is not how we usually define freedom, right? We usually don't say, oh, I feel very limited today. It's very freeing, actually. But that's the paradox of being a child of God. Freedom is not being the one in control. Freedom is the one who can't do whatever you want. Freedom is the one having a Lord to answer to. Because here's the truth. If the disciples were free in the way that we usually define freedom, getting to do whatever you want, well, left to their own devices, the disciples would have succumbed to the sea and death. It was not independence that saved them. It was dependence upon Jesus, however, that meant for them liberation, freedom, true freedom, and life. See, that's why we take a day like today to treasure our fathers. Happy Father's Day, dads, by the way. See, God gives the gift of fathers to teach their children to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That's the number one job of being a dad. Fatherhood is not about fierce independence. It's not about being machismo, masculinity, and all that kind of stuff. Fatherhood is not about being a manly man or showing kids how to be tough. That's not fatherhood. No, fatherhood is about teaching your kids not independence, but dependence upon Jesus. 
fatherhood is teaching your children to be dependent on Jesus for your forgiveness and your life and your salvation. And it starts by leading by example. That's fatherhood. Fatherhood is passing on to the next generation dependence on God. See, loving fathers bring their children to church week after week to teach them about dependence on Jesus for their life and forgiveness and salvation, which is something that everyone needs to learn from their dad because there's plenty of things to fear in life. See, the truth is that that in your baptism, Jesus has picked a fight with the devil The devil does not like things being taken away from him that he thinks are his. And that's exactly what Jesus does in your baptism. Jesus puts you in a new place as his own child, his own beloved, somebody who belongs to God the Father. And Satan doesn't really like that, and sometimes he shows it. Sometimes Satan comes at you with tragedy and sin and even death, The storms of your life are there to make you doubt God. But they're also there to make you depend on God. Because Jesus doesn't provide answers to all the storms. Jesus doesn't provide answers to evil and tragedy and sin. Jesus doesn't explain why bad things happen. It might be easy enough to say, well, it's because of sin, it's because of the curse. But Jesus doesn't go and say why those things are there. What Jesus does do is he provides a solution. He doesn't tell you to man up, to face your fears, and to just get over it. He doesn't provide explanations. He doesn't provide excuses. Jesus provides the solution. Because the disciples feared Jesus' power in the boats the same way that the women would fear the news of Jesus' resurrection power on Easter later on in Mark. If you go to the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, it says this, The angel at the empty tomb said to the women who had come there that morning, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they have laid him. And the women went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were, what? Afraid. When you fear the right things, you find freedom. Jesus uses his fearsome power for your salvation. On a horrific cross, Jesus robs you of your sin. And from an empty tomb, he declares authority over your eternal life. Jesus is the solution to sin and death and even the power of hell. And in your baptism, you know your place. Jesus is in charge and you are not. You know, when we hear that phrase, know your place, sometimes there's two ways to take that, right? Usually when you hear somebody saying, know your place, it comes across, know your place. And it doesn't feel very good. But when Jesus tells us, know your place, friends, that's good news. Because it means he's your Lord and you belong to him. You are God's creature. He is the creator. You have your place and he his. You are dependent on him for everything, and he is feared because everything comes from him. You have your place, and he has his. You are at God's mercy, and God is merciful. Know your 
place. See, as Christians, we find freedom in fearing God as our loving Father. Because Jesus rose as your Lord, you also will rise. Because Jesus is your Lord and you are not, one day Jesus will say, peace be still. And all of creation will be tamed. And one day, because Jesus is Lord and you are not, one day he will use his fearsome power in love And he will declare, behold, I am making all things new. And at his simple word, all tears will be wiped away. Death shall be no more. And neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. And until that day, we come to church week after week after week. And frankly, when we come, we come in fear and trembling to the throne of God, and we confess our sins to him. We tell him we did not act as if we knew our place, but we come before him knowing our place because it's here at this altar where our sins are forgiven again and again and again in Jesus' name. Dear Christian, you are God's creature. You are God's redeemed creature. Rejoice and know your place under the God of mercy and love. Peace be still. In Jesus' name, amen.